Yeah. We have a lot of work to do in terms of bringing all our residential standards across the country up to a level that we can be proud of. Get involved. Don't don't be loners. Uh, wisdom. My kids would laugh at that. But anyway, you know, I am a wise old lady, you know. Hello and welcome to another episode of Elder Wisdom Stories from the Green Bench. My name is Kathy Buckworth, and I'm going to be joined in a minute by my co-host Evelyn Brindle from Schlegel Villages. And as usual, we are going to be bringing you some wisdom today on this podcast, but we're also going to be giving you someone with a bit of a, I'm going to say a colorful past. What do you think, Evelyn? Good morning. Uh, Good morning, Kathy. Yes, I agree with you. She does have a very colorful class. And In several countries, of course, Malta and Canada. I remember always loving to see a parade, especially the annual Thanksgiving ones we used to have in Detroit when I was a youngster. But I think anyone always enjoys watching those big floats going by and wondering how they all came to be and put together. Uh, So we'll find out a little bit about that this morning when we talk with Esther Polis on our green bench. I agree with you, Evelyn. I watch those parades, and especially when you watch with kids or grandkids, and they're so wide-eyed, but so am I, because I cannot figure out how they put those floats together. And so it's, it's so exciting today to talk to a pro, to talk to Esther, and to hear all about her life, first in Malta, and then in Canada, and the carnival floats and the costumes and the flags that she has put together. I think you're there right now, Esther. Good morning. Good morning. It's so lovely to have you on the podcast today. Yeah, but the flows that we use center to is not the one in Toronto. Um, the carnival, we used to go, like the floats we we done over here in Whitby. But in Toronto, we got to the carnival and make the floats with the dancing. Mm-hmm. Okay. And you used to make the costumes as well, is that right, Esther? Yes, me and my sisters. You have a few sisters. <laughs> yes, I had. I have a. I had a six sisters and five brothers. Oh my goodness! And where are you in that lineup, Esther? I was the sixth one. The sixth one. So you immigrated from Malta to Canada um, in 1965 yourself, but I think some of your family was already here. We still have our family, yeah. But my a few of my sisters and brothers passed away. Mm-hmm. Okay. But we we used to work together, and when we were young, we used to make a place, you know, for charity. With my dad. Mm -hmm. I understand your dad was quite a performer as well. Oh, yes. He was really the champion. (laughs) And you sang. Is that right? Yes. I used to sing, yes, between the drama and the fires, you know. Great. Uh, Very entertaining family. But why... uh, Or how did you come to be interested in creating costumes? I understand you made quite a lot of them through the years. Yes, because it was in our family, even from when we were young, you know. My my aunties and uncles, they used to make costumes and and, um, lots of things for for the city. Okay. Did everyone in Malta participate in all of these carnivals? I understand every town had sort of a carnival of their own, named after their saint. Um, yes. So um, my my um, my husband used to make flags, 
and Malta, every village and every city, they used to have a patron saint. And they used to, uh, to, to have flags on the roofs, you know. Oh. And my husband used to make these flags even for schools over here with the patron saint. I got lots of pictures to show. I understand that one of the flags that was made um, commemorated the Canadian paratroopers, and it's now on display in Ottawa. Yes. Mm -hmm. That was the paratroopers flag. Okay. Why why did you commemorate them? Was there some particular reason? No, they ordered this flag. It was somebody from Brooklyn. They oh. ordered this flag and they took it for the parade for the, the um Canada Day one day. Mm -hmm. And they liked it and they left it in the museum. So when you're designing floats and costumes, Esther, I've always been curious because I'm not a creative person myself. Um, do you come up with the ideas yourself or do you get suggestions and, and what's your preference? We, we used to, because we opened a club in Whitby here for the Maltese people. Mm -hmm. my, all my family got, got together. You know, we were a lot because then my kids, they started to grow and they were teenagers and they love dancing. And so we decided to make these dances for people, for the Maltese people. But then it got so big that we used to do it every year and we make the costumes every year. So every year we have to have another costume. You're not gonna wear the same. So I end up with 120 costumes. Where did you keep them all? <laughs> And then I, and then when we moved, we were like, and we closed the club after a few years. Then, then I sold them, and because my kids, they used to tell me we don't have a. I I try to sell the tickets, you know, for the dance, and they said I don't have a costume. Oh, say so yeah, okay, I make you one. So I used to end up making for my kids and for my relatives, some of them. And it was really interesting. And I got three times the first prize. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. and in the middle, in the middle of the show, of this dance, we used to make a show between us, you know, all, all the sisters and brothers. And it was so nice that everybody was interested to come for our, for our dances. And you had all kinds of different themes on your floats and your costumes. I know you had one, a, a flying saucer one. Can you tell me about that one? Yes, the flying saucer, that was really something very special. It was, we entered this carnival in Toronto. And they told us the, what, what the title is going to be about. And they said, we, we want uh, the Martians um, fighting with the um, superheroes. Oh, my gosh. And we started to make these, these things. And my brothers and my brothers-in-law, they got together in my garage every Saturday and they used to make this flying saucer. So we put the Martians in, the Martians comes out and they fight with the superheroes. And it was so beautiful because they were all in green and we had to paint their faces and their hair in green. And the superheroes, my daughter was a one, the Wonder Woman because she was a great dancer. And we used to hire this guy to show the, show them the dance, like uh, how to to pretend that they are fighting, you know. And it was so beautiful. We won sixteen trophies and six hundred dollars. Wow! <laughs> what what year would that have been, Esther? Pardon? When was that? That was, uh, oh, I think, about thirty years ago. Oh, wow. Because I am 95 years now. One of the things I found, it, 
the flag is uh, something special for Malta because uh, it has the George Cross on it, which yes, uh, the, um, J J King George. Yes, you see, exciting. He gave us the uh, the, the uh, he awarded the the, uh, the Maltese people about the you know how much they fought uh, the last war. They were very brave people. Yes, they were very brave, and we were you know under the Turks and under the Romans and under so many people, but they never won it. They always, Malta was the winner. And he came, I remember that I was about 12 years old when he came and gave us the George Cross. And that's what they put on the flag. Quite a beautiful flag, red and, white and red and the cross red is and up white the and with the, and, yeah. my, and my husband, he made hundreds of them for the Montes people. Well, it's a beautiful flag and one to really cherish. Yeah. Have you ever been to Malta? No, I haven't. And actually, oh. uh, I haven't really known much about it. I know it's in the Mediterranean Sea. Mo Malta is very, very small. Yes. But, but the history is very, very big. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Oh, it goes all the way back to St. Paul. <laughs> yes. Which, yes. Uh, and yes, St. Paul was going to Italy, but then him, I think from the will of God, that he got into a storm and his wreck in, in Malta, and we still have the bay named for him where he was, you know, um, stuck in Malta. Yes, a lot of the churches there are named. Uh, oh, and there is the church and there is the catacombs where he was because they thought that he was, uh, you know, uh, they put him they, they put him like in a, in a prison, but it was like a catacomb. It's still there. You can go and see lots of things there. Yeah. Quite a lot of uh, very interesting history. And unfortunately, I think a lot of that was also destroyed during World War II because of all the bombing, right? Oh, we suffered so much. We were yes. buried twice. Oh, dear. Because I was born in the city near close to the harbor. And we were there in the war, and especially in, in the big air raid, the biggest air raid we had on the 15th of January, 1941. The, the, um, the German came with so many, many Stukas, yeah. and they, they bombed all over the city. And we were in, an, in a well, my dad, empty this well and it this well was shared with another three neighbors say they done it like a shelter they mm -hmm. empty it and we used to go in there so we were, my our house was all down and we were all stuck in this well wow. and then and then by law is supposed to have other uh, entrances eh Mm -hmm. And we went, got, they got us out from another entrance of the well. And then we went to, they took us with the military truck. We went to Wimdina. It's a very far city from the harbor. And my aunties, they were there, refugees. refugees. And we went over there and they took us, the soldiers, and then we were buried there too, because the one across the street, they came unexpected. The enemies came unexpected one night and they drew, dropped the bombs and the streets are so narrow that it, they were not, the bombs, they were not on our, on our house, on the house across, but 
all the doors and the windows were blocked with the stones because more the, the houses are all with stones. So mm. then, then we were lucky that about um, a block away from us there was a convent of monks and they came and opened a hole and we, they took us all out one by one. We were 45 people. A lot of the uh, people from Malta did come to Canada. I think all of your family did and you came in 1965 uh, yes. to Toronto. Uh, it was quite a large uh, group actually, or community, I should say, uh, of Maltese. And I, I didn't know this, but I found out that uh, at one point uh, there's a little Malta in the, the junction area of Toronto. Yeah, Dundas. It, yeah, yes, Dundas and Runnymede. Is, is that the area you lived in when you came? Yeah, no, we always we came to it be because my sisters they were working at the mental hospital here in Whitby, so we came here to the, to stay with them till we find some somewhere to go. Well, I understand that a lot of uh, well, there were a lot of them Maltese people here in the 60s uh, through the 80s that uh, some of them are they have dwindled since then they've gone back to malta or other countries as well so the communities and some of the maltese club that uh, had been originally founded in toronto is now closed unfortunately no it's not closed oh it's no Okay. It's no, there is there is one in Mississauga. They call it the Bent Club. Oh, because my husband made flags for them, and they are in the window there, and they still um, do things every every weekend. Because my daughter, she lives in Mississauga, and she tells me they go to eat sometimes Friday and Saturdays. So along yeah. with bringing your love of costumes and community and Maltese history with you, Esther, you also, I understand, are quite a good cook and make some terrific Maltese delicacies. Can you tell, can you tell us about those? Yes, I used to enter over here in Whitby, but with Oshawa, with Oshawa, I used to enter the Easter around the world with my goodies. Nice. And I used to enter Christmas around the world with my goodies, and I still have a picture in the paper. Can you tell us some of the dishes you might make for that, Esther? Yeah, we have a special tradition for Easter about, we call them figoli. Mm -hmm. This figoli is like a figure. Uh, you know, there are... Uh, there are like cutters, uh, cookie cutters, mm -hmm. but very big, about eight inches big. And, and, they, uh, and that's what we give to, to our family, not chocolate. We go uh, and we decorate them. We make them. I got a film that I made in the, with the... Um, and the, and the, they came to my kitchen one day with the uh, um, cameras and that. And they, and I made them, I was making the figoli and they were taken and put it in the, and they give me the film. I, we used to make them for all the persons like of the family, not only for kids, big ones. And we still doing it every year. Oh, that's so nice. It's like Easter figures, we call them. Mm -hmm. But the re real name in Maltese is Figoli. So besides cooking and making costumes and putting together floats, you worked as a nurse, is that right? Yes, I was a nurse before I got married. And then I, I was with a St. Luke's Hospital in, in Malta for two years because then I got engaged 
And my husband, he didn't want me to work anymore. I understand, yes, that uh, part of the reason your husband wanted you to quit nursing was because he was afraid that the doctor was going to steal you. Is that right? (laughs) He used to give me a ride when I was on late shift and the buses were already finished. So he used to give me a ride home and my husband, he he said, that guy is after you. I don't (laughs) want to. (laughs) Of course he was. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and he did he let me. Oh, that's funny. Um, you have you have kids, correct, Esther? Tell me a little bit about your kids. Yes, I I I had two girls and two boys. Mm-hmm. Um, the 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 girls, one of them was teacher here in Oshawa and Whitby, and when she was forty one years old, she got cancer and she passed away. I'm sorry to hear that. So, yes, sorry yeah, she, for your loss. She she was very good teacher. She used to to be on the paper every every month with her kids because she used to to make plays because it was in our in our family, you know. Mm-hmm. And I, I got another girl that she is a fashion designer in Mississauga. Mm-hmm. She make only bridal dresses and bridal clothes and the mother of the bride, nothing else. Oh, she inherited your talent, obviously. She is very talented, yes. Good. Um, I understand, too, that your daughter who passed away uh, asked you to take on, take care of your, her two children, a teenage son and daughter. Yes. Uh, that had to be a very difficult role for you to take on as, as you were yes. a grandparent. Uh, but yes. can you tell us how that has turned out? And uh, Yes. I, when she was dying... She told me, I am not afraid that I am going to die, but I wanted my kids to see them finishing school. Mm -hmm. She said, will you please promise me to, you know, to finish school? And I promised her, and they did. One of them was from the university, he came the first one, I don't know from how many children, and then they gave him a job in Toronto. And he still have this job about computer. I don't know what he do. <laughs> but then he was only 14 years old. Mm. And the other one, she is so smart. Everybody, all my family say, how smart she is. She she got a job. I don't know what she does uh, on on the te- on the computer. She always on the computer, and she always traveling all over the world. Done a marvelous job. It's not an easy situation for no. either one, you or the children, going through all of that. But you must be so very proud of what. They've yes. accomplished and also what you've accomplished. I'm very proud of them, and I am proud that I kept my daughter the promise. Yes. Because I had to pay for her schooling, you know. Yes. One stayed with the with her husband, like with his dad, the boy, but the girl, she didn't want to stay. She came to my place. And we used to take her to the to the school and pay for her money for for the university and everything. It's not an easy task. But and you must be very very proud of yourself yeah, as well. Yeah, but she come she 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 came last uh, last month to see me. She is in BC now, but she always call me from Spain from Thailand. From here and there, every time, from California, I don't know, she goes all over the place. And that's the love you've been nourished through those years, Esther. She is so smart. All my family say, 
how smart she is. <laughs> and she's smart to keep in touch with you. And she always tell me, I took after you, Nana. Aw. That's <laughs> She always called me for, for recipes when she has some friends. Can you give me this recipe? Can you? Part of the show is always about trying to gather elder wisdom, of course, Esther, and to share it with our listeners. Um, and so you're such a strong sense of community and family. Do you have any advice to pass on to those who are looking to, to keep their, their family close? What, what are some of the things that helped you to keep your family close through all of these times? My advice is that when you keep family together, I used to, to, uh, you know, invite them every single thing that we had around. I make lots of food, and mm -hmm. they go around and they keep coming. And I used to to um, call my sisters and brothers to come and play bingo and play cards. You know, and we always stay together. That's the main thing. And they are still doing it. The Sunday coming, I am invited to my son's place for because he's going to have somebody that came, my niece that came for to Canada uh, for holiday with her all her family, four of them, her husband and two kids. And she is coming to be at my son's place this Sunday. And I am invited there because she wants to see me. Nice. Of course she does. <laughs> and we are always uh, well, well, together. That's the main thing. Yeah, family is always very, very family important. Family is better than friends. Yes. You need friends, but the family comes first. And so when you get together, I assume there's a lot of Maltese food. Um, are you still in the kitchen helping out, Esther? Or are you happy to just oh, sit and I wish food? I wish I had a <laughs> stove. I make lots of things. I understand you made a special meal for a friend of yours there at Taunton Mills. Yes, I made the brajoli. And every said how good they were. And even Lee, the one that in charge of the dining room, he came to congratulate me how good it was. He said, I never had a, ta a taste like this. Wonderful. Everybody got to share. But these figures, there is a girl that works here. Her name is Christina. And she, she is related to somebody that is Maltese with her family. And she said, I know what you're talking about, about those figoli, because they are still tradition, you know, for Easter. Mm -hmm. Every time that we go to Malta, we have to, to buy two more figures. They are very big and very nice. Like, we make the dough, and we cut it. Each figure, we cut two cutters, and we put one in the bottom, and then the, we put the marzipan in the middle, and another top, another top with the with the crust, and then we decorate them. So my mom used to make all the figoli for us, and then on Good, Good Friday, she put us around the table with lots of color dicing, everybody has to color his own figola. Mm -hmm. mm. And so that was a very good tradition. They're, my kids, they are still doing it. Wonderful. Those, those traditions are the, the one important thing we pass on. Yes. There's also a special carnival cake. Uh, that uh, is a Maltese favorite, a, a prinjolata, is that right? Yes, we, I, I have pictures for, uh, on the paper that they, I was decorating these figoli and my daughter, she, she said, Mom, I'll be back, the teacher, the one. And she said, and she brought this, this guy, 
and he took the picture of me decorating the figoli. I used to, because lots of Maltese people, they like to keep the tradition, but they don't know how to make them. That's right. So I used to make them, they used to call me before Easter, can you make me six, can you make me four? And I used to make them and sell them. Kept you busy. Yes, I was always busy, especially with knitting. I am a professional knitter. Wonderful, yes. I had. What do you knit? Yes, I still knit. I am. I just finished an Afghan, and I made twenty-two Afghans. Oh my goodness. <laughs> 22, and I don't, I can't even count how many sweaters I made because I got a um, daughter in law that she used to work in the court, in the courthouse here in Whitby and Oshawa for 40 years. She, she worked, and every Christmas she used to tell me, I don't want nothing else, I want another sweater. She after Christmas she go to work with it, and she called me. She said, "Esther, can you make me two blue, one one red, two white?" And she ordered. <laughs> Her shopping list, eh? <laughs> and they used to sit down watching TV and knit, and I still knitting. I have one. I have one final question for you, Esther. You're such a creative person, obviously that. Creativity is still alive, still alive in you. If you could design a float today, what would you want? What would what kind of float would you design today if you could? Oh, I, I, if I, if I have to, if my husband was still alive, he was very good man. If he is still alive, he make a float about the peace. Mm. Peace. Mm -hmm. I think that's a wonderful note to finish on. Um, Evelyn, did you have any other questions for Esther today? I, I just want to say how much I enjoyed learning about your country, Malta. Uh, I wish you go and see it. My kid, Jay, just came from holiday from there. Mm. And they said, Mom, we had such a good time. Well, thank you so much for this journey today, Esther, to Malta. And and through your life. It's I enjoyed it too. Sorry, I talk too much, I think. <laughs> no, you Not don't. at all. <laughs> Not at all. And, and uh, <laughs> once again, you've been listening to Elder Wisdom Stories from the Green Bench. My name is Kathy Buckworth, and Evelyn Brindle and I have had the extreme pleasure of speaking today with Esther Pullis, who has told us so much about her life in Malta and in Canada. Yes. Uh, I encourage you to listen um, to our other podcasts as episodes as well. If you go to the Elder Wisdom Stories from the Green Bench, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Esther. It was very nice talking to you. May you have many happy days ahead. Okay, thank you. Elder Wisdom Stories from the Green Bench is brought to you by Schlegel Villages, a complete continuum of care, offering independent living to long-term care, celebrating and honoring the wisdom of the elder. To learn more about us, please go to our website, schlegelvillages.com.